may I wear the good things there. <laughs> <laughs> All the way from England. <laughs> We have a very special guest who is about to join us right now. It is the British High Commissioner to Jamaica, Mr. Asif Ahmad. Let's welcome him. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good Thank morning. You. Oh, you do. Very good. So, first, what is your job like? What is your job like? You know, it's what's nice about it is different mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. No two days are the same. Yes. But uh, there are some common themes. Mm -hmm. It's basically, you know. What are we trying to do here in Jamaica yes. to make life better uh, for Jamaicans mm -hmm. and for British people who visit? And you know, there are 800,000 people of Jamaican heritage living in the UK. And oh, they wow. come here yes. to visit family, friends. Mm -hmm. Every now and then some people get into some trouble and that's always the number one priority, you know, to fish somebody out of some difficulty that they have. Uh, every week somebody is traveling to the UK and uh, usually it works fine. You know, 85% of these applications go through smoothly. Mm -hmm. Every now and then there's a bit of a glitch and people have found out how to get to me and my colleagues and uh, when we can we do help. Uh, but there are many, many things. That well, look at that. I have never been to the UK. I have never been to the UK. I would love to, you know, I'd love to go someday. If only I knew somebody who I could talk to. Well, you're talking to the right person, you know. <laughs> uh, later on, we're going to have uh, somebody from the, uh, you know, the, the airline industry, so yes. they can make the, the journey here. It's direct mm -hmm. from either Mobe or from uh, Kingston. Mm -hmm. um, and also, you know, many, many people think it's difficult. Yeah. But you know, if you've got the, if you've got a travel history that's that's good, if you've been to North America, mm -hmm. the UK, and the rest of Europe, they should be in the clear. They're, they're really because we want people to yes. come to to come and watch football, to come and. Uh, come our universities to mm -hmm. just enjoy music or whatever the UK has to offer, the sightseeing, and, and also so many people just to go and visit family and friends. Yeah. What would you say are three of your biggest achievements in this um, job? Well, there's so many, but I think the, the, the biggest really one was something that was actually quite challenging and difficult, mm -hmm. which was the whole Windrush issue. Because mm -hmm. We suddenly found that because of the way in which our immigration policy had developed and was mm -hmm. uh, implemented, a lot of people were disenfranchised, some people were deported, uh, and it became a huge, huge yeah. challenge for mm -hmm. us. And for us to be able to use our connections here with the Jamaica, talk to the media, to explain mm -hmm. how things have gone wrong and what we did to put right, and now to put it onto the path where people can apply for the compensation and mm -hmm. forward. That really is, you know, you can't always have uh, a day job that is not challenging, and this was the biggest one. Uh, we had. But there are other things which are, uh, I'm very, very pleased with. Uh, we have just started one of our biggest programs in Jamaica, which is £55 million pounds worth of, of assistance with agriculture mm. in St. Elizabeth, in Clarendon, and St. Catherine. And they're all rolling out. What oh, has the response been like so far? Well, the response really was great from farmers because yes. one of the biggest challenges in St. Elizabeth, where I actually spent Easter of 2018 in my own free time, mm -hmm. the long weekend, just going to a farm and staying on And that's where the majority of my family members are. Well, there you go, reside. see I've already yes. struck home. <laughs> and what struck me mm -hmm. is that, that, you know, in one part of what I experienced, you know, you could have gone back 300 years in life where somebody mm -hmm. on the farm had not changed one bit. The, yeah. the poor fellow had still hadn't been able to you know, buy shoes. Mm. So it's really sort of piece rate work on a day-to-day on -day basis, not knowing from one day to the next. The farm owner worrying about whether the war supply would continue, yeah. or whether the melons he was growing would be stolen the very next morning, uh, and whether there would be enough buyers interested, or whether mm -hmm. they would go to Costa Rica and get what they need. So that, for me, is a big thing that's going on. It'll take three years for all of this to, to work its way through. But can you imagine a situation where people in St. Elizabeth, in where we are mm -hmm. operating, no longer have to worry about whether the war is going to come from? It must be a huge relief. Yeah. yeah. And we can look at other things, but that's some, something pretty big. As well. So those are two. Do you want a third one? Yeah, I'm sure. I, I know about the Shivening Scholarship. Yeah. I have a couple of friends who have benefited from it. Um, Kim, um, Kim, Kimberly, Kimberly, she's doing, uh, what is it? I think, in media journalism. Yeah. So she's told me about it and she's enjoying um, her, her time. You know, in every place I've been ambassador, that's been my, my favorite uh, engagement, Shivening uh, mm -hmm. uh, Scholars, where uh, brilliant people with a passion to do something for Jamaica when mm -hmm. they come back, uh, apply and we find uh, anything between 15 to, to 18 people depending on the budget yeah. uh, to pay for a master's degree, mm -hmm. everything uh, fixed for them, 
uh, with a little bit of spare money for shopping. Jeez. And then they come back and do brilliant things here, whether it's forestry management, whether it's working in business, whether it's uh, in the media, mm -hmm. whether it's looking at the rights of, of, of vulnerable communities like the LGBT community. Yeah. Um, you know, we are seeing people making a real, real impact. And from August onwards this year, we're going to again go out to Jamaica and say, if you've got a real drive to make a difference to this country, talk to us because we might be able to help you along the way. I like some of the points that you just raised. Um, discuss what would you say are some of the, the values um, that the British people have that you would like to see a lot more of um, in Jamaica? Do you know, I think there are many shared values, to be honest with you, because our association is, is, is yes. so, so strong. So, you know, you start from home, this whole thing about the family and the importance mm -hmm. of family and friends mm -hmm. and how you keep a sense of community. Yes. Because when the community starts to dysfunction in any way, from individuals right out to um, whole communities, mm -hmm. and we have similar challenges in the UK to here, you know, mm -hmm. we've suddenly got a mob surge in knife crime amongst young people, so robbing them, each other of their future. Uh, we have good things, you know, where people are putting uh, environmental practices mm -hmm. into, into their communities so that we, what we do is more sustainable, removing plastics and those sort of things. So those values are, I, I think, are, are universal. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the other one I, th I actually think is, is your expectation of what a government should do for you. Yes. Um, and you know, we're both democracies, Jamaica mm -hmm. and ourselves, and we both uh, have very similar rules and regulations mm -hmm. with the Commonwealth heritage. But there's always going to be a dialogue between the people and the government of the day, mm -hmm. and we as civil servants are somewhere in the middle. Yes. Uh, our job is to implement whatever the policy of the government of the, of the day is. But you know, governments can become very distant, and I'm sure you face this yourself. You know, when you mm -hmm. fill in a form and you want something, mm -hmm. you're almost made to feel as though you're the small person. Yes. Against this big edifice of state, mm -hmm. and traditionally, government places have always almost thrived on that. You know, big pillars, big gates, and formality when it should be the other way around. And I think the digital world is changing all of that. Suddenly, you could bypass all of us, uh, put your applications in all, online, mm -hmm. buy your driving license, and, and things that government really held on to as, as this is the power we have over you. You, know, yeah. you. you do this, and we will give you, whereas actually it's the other way around. You have every right to have an ID card, uh, a driver's license, uh, uh, help with social security if that's a, ch a challenge for you, or whatever. And I think that's the big change. And I think it's coming to Jamaica too, where governments are looking at ways in which uh, something that was secretive and a bit of a power game, the tables are turning, where you know we become really truly what we're supposed to be, which is to serve the public because our salaries are paid for by right. the taxpayer. Oh, that is an important point. Could you just look right in the camera and repeat, repeat that line? No. What I'm saying is that as a civil servant, our job is to serve the public, and it's not the other way around. And uh, we have to demystify it and make uh, it ourselves more accessible. Yeah. Speak to us briefly about trade. Yes. You know, um, people who are a lot older than you, a hell of a lot older than you, closer to my age, will remember what Jamaica was like uh, at, at the time of independence. Mm -hmm. And I would wager that almost everything that people had, wore, did, drove in, yeah. was British. Mm -hmm. And the only legacy of that I see now are these Bedford trucks and Leyland trucks huffing, huffing and puffing up and down the, the, the hills. <laughs> um, slowly it's coming that our brand new redesigned Mini and the, the Jaguar Land Rovers, mm -hmm. etc. But our trade with Jamaica has really fallen off a cliff. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it should be right up there, you know, mm -hmm. instead of, uh, of, of where we are now. And the other way too, to yeah. Jamaica mm -hmm. selling things. And one of my real missions here is to start to reverse that. It's going to take mm -hmm. some time. But there are huge opportunities for people in Jamaica here who are in the food business, in the music business, in sports, mm -hmm. um, in things that they haven't even looked at yet, uh, beauty products and, and, and fashion products that yeah. are so much in demand over here. Mm -hmm. There's a real opportunity for somebody in Jamaica to establish a global brand, use the UK, as they did with the music industry, when you know, Bob Marley and others, Peter Tosh, mm -hmm. they use the, the UK as a jumping off point for their musical career, yeah. um, because right now it's 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 pitifully small. And you know, over the next two more years that I have here, I want to make a big uh, splash on that. Okay, so you discussed um, something just now about music, yeah. and Alita Birdie told me that you're quite the Bob Marley fan. More than that, I, I you know I've had such a privileged life. I've lived 
not just in Europe, but mm -hmm. in Asia, in, and then my heritage is from the Indian subculture. My parents met because my mother was a singer, and she met my dad in yes. the BBC World Service in, in, in London. So we've ha had music, but it is music of every sort that I actually appreciate. But uh, reggae music on Bob Marley for us in the UK is very, very special. It's special for a whole host of reasons. One is yes. that you know, Bob Marley lived in the UK, yeah. uh, and so, so many people did, so it really was their second home coming back and forth. Then with people like Island Records and, mm -hmm. and the like, and, and uh, you know, with uh, Blackwell, and, you know, they, they really became the producers and the marketeers of, of reggae. Then you had people mimicking reggae, so you had uh, uh, UB40. Oh yeah, I'm familiar uh, with them, yeah. And then uh, Apache Indian came in and started to take that. And there are many, many types of reggae that, that actually in some ways it's sort of made in Britain reggae. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing which I actually find puzzling, it's a bit of a challenge to Jamaica. What's that? Which is how come I can't find live reggae music when I want to hear it? I, you know, if I said tonight, let's go somewhere where you can guarantee live reggae music. I, I think there's a place called um, Red Bones or... Uh, uh, yeah, I've been there. Okay. Uh, it's uh, on, on a good day, yes. On a bad day, it's a CD. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good point that you have raised yeah. because now I'm actually trying to scan my brain to, to see if I but, can identify something. But, that, but that is, that is mm -hmm. you know, if you ask me, you know, where in the U London or the UK right now can you listen to a big rock band mm -hmm. or a musical concert or... Uh, you can I, easily I can, listen. I can, I can tell you, yeah. here's the go-to site and mm -hmm. in every pub there's folk music, rock yes. music. Sometimes, you know, Mick Jagger and others have just turned up and had a surprise event. Yeah. There's music, con music in the park, uh, the stadia have taken, mm -hmm. taken over. And that's how it should be. Yeah. Port Royal should be buzzing every night with mm -hmm. with every cafe, sort of trench town and up the hill here, whatever. Not manufactured sort of um, hotel music. Yeah, because that's that's the, the that's the the, the version of um, live music that is often uh, presented. No, yeah, but that's mm -hmm. a bit like uh, you know you open up a can of fresh air to smell mm -hmm. it. You know, the, the, it's it's it's, <laughs> it's it's okay, but it's up to a it's, point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but this place should just be. I don't know. It, it should be jumping. Mm -hmm. I literally should be, should be, should be jumping. And and reggae music and really things that have preceded it and and in some extent has followed it, almost instinctively wants to get up and move. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very. Um, it has a very different beat to it. Uh, you know, you can sit there with with listening to classic European music and yeah. it can be in your bow tie and very very serious and you don't want to get up and do anything. Mm -hmm. But it's very difficult to stay motionless. <laughs> hearing. When you hear reggae music, yeah. All right, so I want you to tell me what would you say is your favorite um, Bob Marley song? Wow, there are so so many uh, because uh, uh, no woman no cry is very emotional. Yeah. Uh, then there are three little birds. Is is yeah? That's one. Uh, that's probably my favorite. Of what is there? But quite, you know, the, there are tapes that are emerging now mm -hmm. of of just sessions that he was doing. Um, and then you know when he appeared on quite controversial on the political mm -hmm. field, it started to, to. So I, in some ways, many of the live music that he yeah. did was was him really on. And then I you know I've seen over here not as much as I'd like to, but but I I, I tell you, you you know before we get stuck completely in ancient history, I've, mm -hmm. I've actually been uh, been introduced to Chronics. I um, was just about to ask who and, is one of the, new, the, yeah, the later artists that are really you know he's got following. something you know. To label him as a pure reggae mm -hmm. musician is is uh, probably not not exactly hundred percent right. This is reggae with a with a dancehall flavor. Yeah. He has a, a a different edge, something yeah. else. And what mm -hmm. he has done is really taken off from where Bob Marley was, which is to make mm -hmm. sure that the production values are high. You know, the, mm -hmm. the and musicians are talented. Mm -hmm. That the sound is pure. You know, when mm -hmm. he and even when he's performing live. Mm -hmm. It, it come, comes so I think he's being looked after well you know mm -hmm. people are making sure that you know he's, he's not there with the feedback is killing him and the, the drum sounds like a set of tin cans and yeah. all, you know so yeah and, and also he when I've seen him uh, uh, and so far it's really all been on video I've not been able to mm -hmm. my, my other colleagues in the diplomatic corps said they've found ways of getting there maybe they've kept me too busy <laughs> I've got to talk to my guys here to, to release me every now and then but I really where, where I see he's good is when he actually sings a long piece, where mm. he's, it's almost a trance-like thing, not a three-minute thing just for a single yeah. thing, but when he just lets go, 
really look quite hypnotic in what he does. The lyrics are good. Seems like you really appreciate um, the music. I love um, good music. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, you mentioned Dancehall. Dancehall, for me, uh, has some amber and red warning lights as well. Mm -hmm. You know, it gets to a point where I'm uncomfortable. Yeah. But I can see where it's coming from. It's, mm -hmm. it's, um, it's where Garage and all sorts of other things, mm -hmm. Grime in the UK is yeah. something that my, my nieces keep telling me about. Yeah, I, ju I just discovered um, Steph London and that's, uh, that's kind of a dance hall yeah. in, the, in the UK. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But where it slides into misogyny and mm -hmm. aggression mm -hmm. and violence and mm -hmm. things, I, I begin to think, no, is this, yeah. is this really where we should be? Yeah. Uh, Yes, some people say art reflects society, but then we're trying to change that, that mm -hmm. dynamic in society. So, yeah, I think that comes with what I call a, a health warning. I'm, I have a, a similar um, viewpoint that I'm, I feel as if the artist, you know, talks about their own experiences, but, you know, it's uncomfortable when you actually hear a song and you see it being reflected in the news. Mm -hmm. So if you hear somebody say they're going to do this to somebody in broad daylight, and then you turn on the TV and you see that exact um, image being displayed, it, it, it makes you feel uncomfortable. It does. But, but something that um, clearly makes you feel very comfortable is going to the market. Yes, I'll tell you why. I don't do it, I've, I've, I've never, <laughs> Like I actually have done it, but that was probably ten years ago. And I did that with my mom, but you were there by yourself. That's a very, very simple reason mm -hmm. because of my upbringing. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I spent my first four years of my life in in London. Mm -hmm. uh, then I went to my ancestral homeland of what is now Bangladesh. Okay, uh, that's where my family come yeah. from. I've lived there. I've lived in Pakistan, and uh, then of course I've worked in places like the Philippines, which is mm -hmm. both uh, developing and has its challenges. But my earliest memory is going to market with my granddad. You know, mm -hmm. you just you'd hold my hand and off we would go uh, buy and see what's fresh for the day, because he uh, rather unusually could cook, mm -hmm. and he cooked. My dad could cook, and I too can actually cook. So for me, there's a direct connection between what's available in the market yeah. and what's over here. And over here, it's the same thing. Uh, I've got a great uh, chef, mm -hmm. Jamaican, uh, can cook all sorts of things. But I sort of said, look, I don't want to have. Uh, apples from China. I don't yeah. need strawberries from Australia. Yeah. Tell me what's growing here now. It, make it seasonal. And we take some of our stuff off the trees in the, in the High Commission. And that's what, and the other thing is about market life. And uh, completely by coincidence, I uh, had Glenn Christian over, mm -hmm. of, of Carimed, uh, over, of, over a meal. And I actually said, you know, I've been to Coronation Market and whatnot, and I can almost visualize what would happen if you found a way of asking people just to step aside for a little while, and for a whole new environment to be created over here, which is hygienic and, mm -hmm. and, and really uh, created zones where there would be places where restaurants could cook the stuff that they're selling in the market. Uh, you could have uh, people who are making things yes. and, 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 and the like. Uh, people can... So, so it becomes a place not just to buy things, but it's an economy. It's a go-to place where you feel safe and where people feel safe going to it. Oh, and and I could yeah, see he, like he, he was almost going into a thinking. I didn't realize until later on mm -hmm. that his mother was a Coronation Market uh, vendor, store holder, yeah, yeah. vendor. Mm -hmm. And he basically has made it a passion since then to gather his business friends, talk to the mm -hmm. the the authorities and the mayor to see can we actually do this it's possible if they win the trust of the soul holders if they can say if this is not a land grab yeah so for me when i see a marketplace uh, whether it's in england whether it's in here whether it's in bangkok or mm -hmm. in my granddad's hometown these are this is the life and soul of a place this is you know people people would say for a man of your statue um, in this position to be going to the market, it's not something that you see happen very, very often in Jamaica. So, is it just the fact that how you were raised that grounds you to operate like that, to really immerse yourself in a space where you're connecting with the people on that level? You know, it, you talk about grounding, and that's a very, very mm -hmm. important because it is very, very easy, very easy in my uh, career and what I do. Yes, you know. You have, I've dined with the Sultan of Brunei, the King of Thailand, the Queen, the, 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 queen, mm -hmm. uh, the garden party, I'm her representative on the ground, yes. and I've had dinner in Buckingham Palace and things. And you could suddenly lose all sense of who you are and what you do. I feel like I would have been one of those persons. I would have started talking like, ho ho, hi, hi. Well, I, I tell you, if, no, I, I, need, I, tell I, you. if I need to, I can talk. 
posh if I have to, but uh, <laughs> okay. it, 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 uh, yes. you know, we all do. We we, yes. we fix our language mm -hmm. to, to to where we are. Uh, <laughs> but I've always believed that you've got to got to have been very very rooted. Uh, mainly because of what happened to me as a as a fourteen year old. Okay. Um, I had a privileged life going to international schools, etc. But I was part with my uncle in Bangladesh mm. uh, during the civil war in nineteen seventy one, and at the age of fourteen, I was nearly killed. So I was on the run for three months trying to escape the military because yeah. uh, uh, and my parents were working in China at the time. Mm -hmm. So uh, as a fourteen year old, when you don't know where your next meal is coming from, where you're going to lay your head yes. for, for for the next day. And that whole thing of bluffing your way under military interrogation, escaping mm. across and then coming back. Then at the age of 17, going to the UK, uh, where my mother was practically uh, like a single mother looking after her, my two sisters and mm -hmm. me, we all joined in. I overheard her say that, well, how is she going to find the eight pounds she needed for next week? Mm -hmm. So I sort of said, uh, what are you doing? She said, I, as, as a second job, apart from working at school, I do door to door selling. Mm -hmm. I said, give me a bag, I'll start selling. From the age of 17 onwards, I didn't ask my parents for a single penny. Wow. Right. I went to a full full university on a full grant. Mm -hmm. Basically means that I have nothing in my pocket. Uh, I was desperate to get a job. And so straight out of university, I had five job offers to go mm -hmm. to. For me, there was no leisure mm -hmm. and goofing around at university. So for me, it's not a, a pre let's pretend I'm an ordinary guy. Yeah. I've worked in kitchens. I've cleaned floors. I've... Uh, done door-to-door -door selling in rural England. Uh, but, and I was a successful banker, I you know, joined the diplomatic service, and life is good. Do you see that a lot of life? And both aspects? Both aspects. And then yeah. it comes to, to your aid. You know, when I was in the Philippines, the biggest ever hurricane to hit this planet hit the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And we, the UK, mounted the biggest relief operation. I had an aircraft carrier, eight helicopters, planes coming in, 1,400 people to and as a result of that, I have this wonderful title at the end of my name, CMG. That's a, an award from Her Majesty the Queen yes. for service to Southeast Asia. But it was because of, partly because of the way in which I was able to lead the UK's effort in bringing relief to people who had lost even their ID cards. They, didn't, they couldn't even prove to somebody who they were. And that must be um, personally rewarding. Absolutely. So uh, as, a, as a small child, in cyclones, as they call them in, in Bengal, I used to mm -hmm. actually go into a room and, and against the parent, my parents' mm -hmm. wishes, open the window and watch things flying around. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I've always had this peculiar fascination. Yeah. All right. So what, what I want you to do now is to tell me some of the things that I can um, know on how to be come off as an authentic um, British yeah, and it's an authentic British. What you've got to do is forget about the stereotypes. Okay. For example, mm -hmm. uh, it is not just about eating fish and chips and pies and things. Oh, it's not. Uh, okay. Uh, All right. Chicken tikka masala is the number one selling dish in the okay. UK. So that's the, the first mm -hmm. thing. But I think the the thing that people say about us is politeness. Politeness. And, so and how do you fair. greet someone like you know in the UK? Well, do you say good afternoon? Good, good afternoon. morning, which is actually it's very common. Here. Many of the common courtesies in Jamaica are very similar to what, what we do. The other thing I think is also knowing when to give people space. Sometimes when you go to a, a pub, a man just wants to sit by his glass. It's his, it's his 15 minutes of, of solitude, and you don't intrude on privacy. That's the other thing that we are also very careful. Oh, about. That, that doesn't seem very Jamaican. We like to, you know, to, to what we call fast. Yes. We like to look in other people's business. That's what we. But that about. works too because in in. <laughs> In Birmingham, Bristol, mm -hmm. and other places, you'll see people bring their yard in front of the house. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in our Jamaican mm -hmm. friends there, and, and when you see the Notting Hill Carnival, in the whole of all the, so yeah. it, we are actually less stuffy than than, okay. than you might imagine. How, how I learned a lot was by watching a program called I think it was Keeping Up Appearances. Yes, um, uh, with Miss uh, Mrs. Bouquet. It, it, I think it still comes on on TV um, locally here, and that is what sort of informed me. On yeah. what, in, like, in a way, that's uh, that's ancient history. Uh, <laughs> yes. But but, but it, it, this is a wonderful thing. Mm. It's, it's hugely diverse. You know, you have yeah. people who are working on farms. You have mm -hmm. people working in factories. You've got yeah. people like me who are mad football fans mm -hmm. on, on a Saturday. You've got the other end where you go to Pall Mall and the yeah. clubs in St James where uh, there's a dress code. Mm -hmm. uh, people like dress. 
but then there's Ascot where you know people wear fancy clothes and things. All of those things are there. Yeah. It's a, but it, it's no longer an obligation to be a certain way. Okay. You, know, you can be it's who you are. Relaxed, then. You can be who you are, and we thrive on the fact that we're a multi-ethnic. Okay, uh, so I'm going to ask you: since you you've been in Jamaica, have you ever heard the good things there? Many uh, people you know? say, people say when they say what good, what good. Okay, you know that means something. What I else? Can what else have you learned? Uh, the what other one is that? big up yourself. Oh, which big is, up yourself. Yeah, that that works very well because you know when mm-hmm. however you're feeling, you find mm-hmm. find the time. But I've heard the other one as well, which is small up yourself. When you're trying to take a group photo, okay, okay, <laughs> just small up yourself and come close up. Yeah, so so you you, you huddled it. Huddled I'm going it. to give you a word. I on YouTube I have a, a a catchphrase. This could be very risky. A catchphrase. It's called box cover. Box cover. Box cover. I think it's just something to say. Oh my gosh. Okay. Um. So if, for example, let's just say you had a glass of water, somebody hit it out of your hand. Box cover. That's just it. Is really? there a way that you can say it? Let me hear it. Box cover. Box cover. Yeah. And I want you to hear and say, I may I wear the good things then. That means that I'm I'm dressed properly. Yeah. I have nice clothes on. Right. So I want you to try that line. Yeah. May I wear the good things then. May I wear the good things then. <laughs> <laughs> All the way from England. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for this special interview. <laughs> Peace out. <laughs>